let's look into the news from the FICO Express server. So, uh, first of all, as always for the frequency uh, among you, a little introduction where the server exactly stands. So, Express optimization consists of various different components and they all build on top of each other and for your application that you are working on in your company, you might enter this stack that we see here on the left-hand side at different levels. So you maybe are one of our business solution users or you directly work with our software components, like maybe you develop your models in Express Words Bench, which is our in-house IDE for optimization. You maybe deploy them via Insight to cooperate with your colleagues on the cloud and you probably develop your models in either Moselle or in Python, or you use our server via one of our many APIs in various different programming languages. And speaking of the server, this is where I work, where my team works down in the deepest, the orange level that you see here at the heart of Express, the server core. And as developers in the server team, well, we have three main drivers that we work on uh, in each and every release. So first, foremost, we strive to make our wide variety of optimization algorithms and solvers for yeah, various different types of problems faster and faster with every release. And secondly, we want to make your life more convenient and open new optimization um, applications by offering new modeling capabilities, by enhancing our analysis tools, or by adding other valuable features. And then finally, always aim to further improve our server's numerical robustness, with Express already being the most deterministic and probably the most numerical robust solver. So, and well, yeah, boy, are there many new things. So this is the agenda we would like to talk about in the next 45 minutes. There's new algorithms for MIP performance, like new cutting planes, new heuristics, new branching schemes. We will talk about performance improvements in global server. Um, and there, again, mostly they come from new cuts, new tunings of how and when to generate cutting planes and some new branching schemes. Um, and one of the scientifically most exciting points is our new algorithm for LP solving, uh, which is a primal dual hybrid gradient algorithm. And for our end users, we've got some exciting news from our new object-oriented API and an improved way to using callbacks. And uh, there's some convenient news for Python users. And finally, we will show how all of the above impacted our performance. And yeah, spoiler. We got a nice speed up there. So let's get started with the uh, gory mathematical details of improved MIP performance. Uh, one of the new features in our MIP solver is uh, multi commodity network flow cuts. So these cuts aim at optimization problems uh, where part of the problem uh, is a network with capacities on each arc and multi commodities flowing through these arcs. And this network is encoded or is assumed to be encoded as part of your constraint matrix with everything that belongs to a network model. So there must be flow conservation constraints for each node somewhere and for each commodity. We have demand demands for each node. We have capacity constraints for each arc um, and so on. So forth and yeah, all this is encoded in the constraint matrix. And of course, there might be different ways how users could model such a structure, such a structure, uh, which is why we try to detect this network structure using a heuristic inspired by the literature and adapted to our and our users' needs. And um, this heuristics takes out many of the dependencies on the modeling choices uh, that the user might have taken. And identifying multi-commodity network flows is more complex than 
single commodity networks as each while well, you essentially have a copy uh, for each commodity um, and each of these networks must be detected separately and they must be mapped against each other correctly to get an efficient algorithm in the end and once the networks and commodities are identified and the fixed charges on the network capacities are known then we can generate cutting planes for them this is well, almost, uh, because first comes constraint aggregation, exploiting the network structure that you just detected. And this procedure then involves finding a suitable subset of the nodes in the network, contracting them equivalent to contracting the uh, flow conservation constraints. And after contracting that subset of nodes, you look for the commodities and try to find a subject, uh, subset of them to contract as well. So aggregating, 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 and by aggregating all these constraints, you end up with a single inequality from which you can generate a standard mixed integer rounding uh, cut. So as often in MIP, the art is in aggregating the right constraints in the right way to create a strong cut from um, the information that you detected uh, with your mighty commodity flow structure. So this provides you with a way to conduct promising aggregations. And these cutting planes are now enabled by default on the root node, not in the tree. And there is a new control, MCF, or mighty commodity flow cut strategy that can be used uh, to adjust whether or not these cuts should be applied at the root node or also during uh, the branch and bound tree search if you have a model that features such structures, this might be worth a try. Okay, one of the other new contributions to our MIP solver is a new heuristic called Fix, Propagate, Repair. And this heuristic is based uh, on one that was presented at the MIP workshop, at the uh, computational challenge of the MIP workshop in 2022, where it was the runner up um, and it was developed by one of my team members Domenico who has now re-implemented and improved it inside Express and this heuristic is a local search heuristic with constraint propagation which is a heuristic strategy that quite a few of the Express heuristics already follow and the innovative part here is what the heuristic does when it's trapped inside a local infeasibility from which it cannot escape easily with a single level backtrack. So in this case, it will pull in a strategy that is inspired by the so-called walk sat algorithm from the constraint satisfaction community to repair the local infeasibility and uh, yeah, then afterwards be enabled to continue the fix and propagate scheme. So this is a quite, or it has been implemented as a, quite flexible framework, allowing for varying, various different strategies, variants to be applied. And in our implementation, it runs multiple, multiple strategies and variants sequentially until a feasible solution is found. However, this doesn't work for all problems. So there's again, some structures which makes it more likely that this will work well. And um, it's currently applied rather conservatively so only at about 4% of our problems uh, will be actually affected by this heuristic. But for this small set, this heuristic is a really huge win. So it fills a gap that we had there. Uh, so the next slide it is again on heuristics. So it addresses our heuristic emphasis mode. So this special and quite important heuristic mode is enabled by a single control, the your emphasis control. So setting your emphasis to one will tweak the algorithm to find a good solution or to favor finding good solutions early on in the search process, but potentially at the expense of time that's required to prove full optimality. So it's a trade-off. And this is the one control that's always worth trying when dealing with models that cannot easily be solved to optimality within the given time limits anyway. So there's one control that you want, would want to try as an alternative on your model, that's the one. Um, in many cases, this leads to much better solutions being found when there's a restricted time limit, restrictive time limit, but as always, 
it's not a guarantee. Um, anyhow, in this release, we have once again improved this heuristic emphasis mode. And one improvement that we made is the introduction of a new heuristic that runs on a parallel thread to the root node. And this heuristic performs a fast branch and bound search in case that the problem can be solved quickly using just branch and bound, but no cuts, no strong branches, no frills. Uh, additionally, this heuristic mode has then also be tuned to work better with features that we introduced since it was first implemented. So some retuning happened. Okay. So enough heuristic. Let's look at branching. So here's an illustration that very nicely highlights the relation between branching and uh, cutting planes. So if you look at this little illustration in the upper right, so we look at how we can create a cut from branching on one of the variables. So the red dot here represents a well, fractional solution like the LP optimum, and this sits, well, it's fractional, so it sits in between two integers. And well, this variable here, which is fractional, you could branch down or you could uh, branch it up. And this is what the these lines here, the dotted lines uh, represent. And then the convex hull of the two sets uh, would have this red line here as a face. So this is connecting these two points over here. So this would be the convex hull of these two blue sex sets would contain this here. Um, and as you see, this cuts off the uh, the fractional point. So it's a valid cutting plane. So what does this mean? We can create a valid cutting plane from a disjunction uh, by requiring integrality of the variable. So that's no news at all. This is known since forever and called split cuts. The idea of the new approach then is to use information on how deep this cut here is. So how much it cuts off the polytope to make a prediction on how strong this branching is. So we see uh, this, well, in a sense, dual, be, dual relationship between branching and cuts. So generally speaking, when branching, we always want branches where the convex hull of the two feasible regions is as tight as possible. And this is the same goal that we have at cutting planes. So we want to find cuts from the junctions from which we can derive tight cutting planes. So whatever is a good measure or scoring system in the one case could also provide valuable information in the other case. This is the idea where we are coming from joint work uh, by me and some colleagues from academia. And the idea here is the to use the strength uh, of a cutting plane generated from a disjunction to evaluate how strong the disjunction itself is for branching. So the expectation is that the deeper the cut, the better the disjunction is for branching. And this measure is then used as part of our branching selection process to determine when to apply strong branchings to a particular variable, for instance. Okay, um, special ordered sets. Special ordered sets are constraints on a set of variables, as the name already gives away. There are two types. SOS1 and SOS2, so special order set type 1, type 2. And in, on this slide here, we only care about SOS1. Um, so a special order set of type 1 requires that at most one variable out of a given order set can be non-zero. So such a SOS1 is uh, typically used for modeling discrete choices of variables. Um, well, however, users often do not always explicitly in point this, well, choose at most one out of something. Logic as a source constraint, they might also use a binary reformulation of this. So you might have a set of binary variables where you require at most one of them to be one. Well, you would add this as a clique constraint uh, to your model. And again, uh, as source one, not only requires one out of a set of variables to be non-zero, it also introduces an ordering of the variables. This ordering makes special ordered sets very efficient for branching. Um, so instead of branching on a single variable, 
saying, well, for example, either X is zero or it's non-zero, you can look, look at a group of variables in the ordering and say, well, every variable in the left part out of this ordering goes to non-zero, or everything above this particular point in the ordering to the right-hand side goes to zero. And this has uh, proven to be a very good idea in branching. Um, and the challenge we face is detecting the implied ordering uh, if the user reformulated uh, the special order set and then exploiting it. So in the past, we tried to detect if there was an ordering of unique weights uh, and then uh, explicitly turn such uh, linear modeling constructs into a special order set. And this is not free lunch since special order sets are great for branching, but they complicate things when it comes to heuristics and propagation. And the new development that we did now in this release is that we do not explicitly introduce newly detected special order set, but instead we keep the user formulation and use the detected structure only implicitly for branching. So uh, this also enabled us to be a bit more aggressive with the detection and use more structure for branchings as they cannot interfere with our heuristics anymore, which is why this project was not only a refactoring, but gave also a small performance boost again. Nice. So yeah, one more branching change that we have implemented is being more aggressive in the use of single dual pivots. So you may know that we are using strong branching in uh, branching, which well, strong branching is an expensive procedure per se. So one of the things we use in addition to strong branching are single dual pivots, which in a sense are a very cheap version of strong branching. So strong branching involves solving a full AP relaxation after imposing a potential branching decision, uh, but usually with some iteration limit to it. And uh, in contrast, single dual pivots are just a single iteration. So they are, it's like strong branching with an iteration limit of one. So it's very fast to evaluate because you don't even actually have to execute any pivots. So you can calculate those single dual pivots directly from the Simplex table. And they then help in identifying the best candidates for applying full strong branching. And this neat idea, we will now do even more aggressively after a tree restart in the solver. Uh, yeah, just like we are also more aggressive with strong branching in this case. So this all comes nicely together. Um, next stop, MIP performance pre-solving. The idea of pre-solving is to remove columns and rows from the matrix prior to the actual solve, so pre-solving. Uh, one way of doing this, one among many ways, is by using equations to eliminate columns. So uh, you can resolve an equation by one of the columns and then replace that column by the uh, equivalent term everywhere at the course. So this may then either introduce or remove non-zeros, depending on well, the length of the re expression you're replacing column with the number of times the replaced column appears in the matrix and whether or not the other columns of the expression appear in the affected rows or not. So uh, obviously, you only want to perform such reductions when they do not create too much fill-in because this would slow down your linear algebra later. And while we previously used a quite rough estimate, uh, we have now refined these estimates of how much fill-in will be created and use some more dedicated filters there, which leads to more targeted pre-solving reductions. And the final map technology I'm going to talk about concerns we start. So under certain conditions, the solver may decide to restart the solution process and attempt a new solve, solve from scratch, a technology that we've used for many releases now. And in this situation, it's always valid to ask which information from the first solve to preserve and which to discard permanently. So we previously opted for a simple rule for cuts. If the cut is tight, we keep it, we commit to preserving it and having it around. All other cuts are forgotten. And in 9.4, 
you know, also try to preserve some of the non-tight cuts. So these are stored temporarily and undergo a limited form of pre-solving that does not affect anything else in the problem. And if they are not obsolete afterwards, we add them back to the cut pool for later potential consumption during the solution process. Okay, so enough MIP for today. Let's come to release news on the continuous solvers. So LPs, linear programs, and QPs, quadratic programs. So as teased earlier, we have a whole new algorithm that we are introducing here, the primal dual hybrid gradient method for solving LPs. And to the best of my knowledge, we are the first major MIP solver that has primal dual hybrid gradient PDHG algorithm integrated fully integrated into their solver stack. So um, primary dual hybrid gradient is the first order method. So it uses derivatives, but no second derivatives, which admittedly also would not much make much sense for pure linear problems. And PDAG is an uh, iterative method that alternatingly generates primal and dual solutions. And then the primal solutions are used as the gradient to calculate the next step in the dual space. And the dual solution is used as the gradient to calculate the next step in the primal space and so on and so forth. And the algorithm is, well, it's actually notable for its simplicity and for its low memory overhead, which can be very important for some applications. So. There's no need for factorization or for solving an extended problem. It primarily involves simple matrix vector multiplications in each iterations. And well, uh, there are typically many more iterations as for example, in a barrier algorithm, but much less than in a, as in a simplex algorithm. So memory consumption is low as mentioned and dominated by the problem data itself. There's little overhead. So if you want to solve a gigantic IP that is hard to fit into your RAM in the first place, then this might be your algorithm. Um, the algorithm shares some benefits with our barrier method, such as the, the solution can be used in a crossover to produce a basic solution. This might not always be recommended because this step then again would require a factorization, so you lose the low memory footprint advantage, but it's possible. Um, and also it features a well, somewhat limited uh, warm start ability. So uh, the convergence of uh, primal dual hybrid gradient is not monotonic, but it's linear in expectation. And uh, the barrier method can converge very quickly to a good solution with quadratic convergence. The PDHG method is better for quickly finding an approximate solution, but it's much slower in reaching uh, yeah, strongly feasible solutions, let's say. So with very few violations, this is not a method for it. So it's recommended to use this algorithm to find an approximate solution while in the order of 10 to the minus four error or so, instead of the typical 10 to the minus six, uh, which is our default feasibility tolerant. And generally, this is not a cure all uh, thing, it's rather for specific applications because it's generally slower than the barrier method, uh, well, about six times in the measurements that we took, but it scales very well to extremely large problems which the barrier method might not be capable of handling after some point. And as said, if memory is an issue, PDHG is definitely worth a try. Okay, so while technically not being a barrier algorithm and with all the differences that I just mentioned, the PDHG method is currently enabled through our barrier API and controls in Express. And this is because the solution properties, so what you get as a user, they are most similar to uh, a barrier algorithm. So you can use it for a piece if you want to try it by starting a barrier source, so but setting the control bar alt equals four to select this special algorithm. This is what you need to do as a user to try PDHG. And this switches the solver um, well, 
use our prime into hybrid gradient instead of a typical barrier solve. So um, PDHG method, we use some of the same controls as the barrier method, such as specifying the number of threads and warm starting, and you can use the primer and do a feasibility stopping criteria from barrier to adjust the termination criteria. But there are also some new controls specific to PDHG for fine tuning. And uh, finally, PDHG is supported in concurrent when you run concurrently with simplex, but not yet concurrently with barrier. So some first, but not full support for concurrent pre serving uh, concurrent LP serving there. Okay, um, there's another change to note for solving APs, QPs, SOCP problems with barrier. And this is that we've made a uh, AVX2 instruction sets the default for barrier solves now. So previously the AVX without two, instruction set was the default, AVX2 had to be enabled manually with the CPU platform control. And AVX2 provides some significant benefits. Uh, and since, well, most modern machines support AVX2, there should not, this should not really pose any compatibility issues. But if you have an old server, stole it from an IT museum or what, uh, the solver will automatically detect that AVX2 is not supported. You will fall back to the old uh, SSE2 or AVX code, so nothing to worry on your side. Uh, and you can always use the CPU platform control to explicitly switch between the two if you want to make old and new machines fully uh, compatible on your side. Okay, um, the global server has seen a lot of improvements in this release. So you might remember that one and a half year ago, we had the beta release of Express Global in version 9.0 and the first public release in version 9.2, about nine months ago, uh, which to the best of my knowledge made FICO Express the first major MIP solver that had a global solver for MIP fully non-convex problems directly integrated into their MIP server and part of their technology stack. So the initial release uh, was roughly on par with the best open source servers out there. And um, well, afterwards, now we got tremendously faster, mainly due to uh, enhancements in handling other approximation cuts inside the global server. So this is because we have become much more aggressive in applying other approximation cuts and more intelligent in creating them. So for instance, for trigonometric functions, we now create more special uh, out approximation cuts that approximate the convex hull of these functions very tightly. Additionally, we have improved the selection of branching strategies, especially for odd functions. So for instance, odd polynomials or certain trigonom trigonometric functions. Um, and another valuable feature in the global solver is running our SAP local solver that Express had had for years as a heuristic within the global server. So our technology there allows us to find candidate solutions for the mixed integer linear part of the problem easily with our existing MIP heuristics. And then we run the SAP local server to solve the remaining non-linear continuous part. So, and when and how this is exactly done is a complex scheduling problem for which we now found a nicely improved balance. So uh, the global server has also received feature enhancements for uh, instance, the new functions XPS gets solution and XPS gets legs that we introduced in version 9.0 along with XPS optimize can now be used inside callbacks of a global or a MIP solve to retrieve the current incumbent solution. So further, we have introduced some new controls for fine tuning the global solver. There are global euro strategy. This controls how frequently we call the SAP local solver. Oh, mentioned what I just talked about. Uh, global num init LP cuts, what a name. Uh, this determines the number of outer approximation cuts to create for the initial approximation we saw solving, solving the first linear relaxation. So 
uh, how much effort do, do you put in your initial AP? Um, global NAP cards and global three NAP cards, these control the number of rounds of auto approximation cards to perform at the root node and throughout the tree. So uh, tuning the default of this behavior, so the default behavior of these controls is what has contributed to our significant performance improvements that I will show later. Um, okay, mathematics aside, uh, reboot, re revamp, uh, server algorithm technology aside, let's look into what new features and API works are available for all users and modelers. So first, let's say a few, few words on our new APIs for Java and C Sharp. So in principle, there's two ways of how you can build an optimization solver API. So uh, on a very high level. So one is a matrix oriented uh, one, low level API with index based modeling. So that's a thin wrapper around your C API and it maximizes performance, but limits readability. And then there is an object oriented uh, version like our existing and slightly out fashioned, let's say BCL, uh, where variables and constraints are objects that's more readable, but less efficient because there was some overhead. And our new object oriented API combines the best of these two worlds. So the new Java and C sharp interface allows to model mathematical problems in an object oriented manner. This comes with an improved readability and maintainability of the model compared to the matrix oriented modeling approach. And to enhance flexibility, matrix oriented modeling is still supported in the new interface. So we augment the new uh, matrix oriented API by an object oriented layer. So where objects map directly to indices, um, worked, this API works directly with the express solver. There's no separate modeling layer and all modeling happens in managed memory. So this gives a good compromise between expressive modeling, easy maintenance and efficient data handling. So in summary, our new API provides an efficient, intuitive, object-oriented modeling experience. It supports all solver features and modern language constructs, providing a consistent user experience across different programming languages. And memory usage and performance have been significantly improved as compared to previous APIs, reducing model building times by up to eight times for complex models with millions of variables and constraints. This leads to increased efficiency, better user experience, Seamless tool integration. So, um, so far for this sleek preview, I can imagine you have a lot of questions on this. So more on this topic will be on June 4th. There have also been a few uh, changes to, well, the C API and all APIs building on top of it. So all the SYN APIs um, to stay in the SYN low level APIs to stay in the lingo of the last two slides. Um, and these are mostly convenient changes based on uh, feedback from our users. So one of these changes involves the pre and sole callback. And this is the callback that gets fired when the solver has a candidate integer solution, but before it's been accepted as the incumbent. This callback allows the user to inspect the solution and then either reject it or accept it. And previously, the workflow we, uh, or some workflows required creating an opt note callback if you wanted to implement any cutting planes, branches, bound tightening to cut off the candidate solution. So if you did not only want to reject it, but want to uh, act upon it. So in the opt note callback, you had to detect when the solver was about to declare the current AP relax relaxation solution as integer feasible and then take appropriate actions if it was not acceptable for your personal application. So now all of this functionality has been consolidated into the pre and so callback. Um, there's one caveat. Heuristic solutions 
so solutions that come from the express heuristics, uh, not from the node API solve, can still only be rejected or accepted. But with the node API solution, you can now add cutting planes to cut it off. You can tighten uh, your node problem bounds. You can um, uh, apply new bounds and uh, add uh, new integer solutions. Like you take the solution candidate, create an own solution, form it a different solution using the express at MIPSOL function. Or you can do your own branching or possible in the pre install callback now. Essentially, anything you could do in the opt-node callback can now be done in pre install It might also be worth noting that there is a control called serialize pre install which ensures that this callback is called in a deterministic order globally across all threads. So without this control, control, it is still called deterministically, but only deterministically per thread. So um, then the XPS at MIPSOL function has also seen a few changes. It is now supported in more callbacks. As I said, the original intention was that it should only be used for the opt-node callback. Now there are more callbacks where it's explicitly supported, like I just mentioned, pre-insole, and also the insole callback. Um, so we guarantee that any solutions added in these callbacks will be processed. Uh, for these three callbacks, all solutions will be immediately processed after leaving the callback. And in case of the opt node, this even would uh, trigger another firing of the opt node callback. Um, and you can now also add solutions uh, via XPS at MIPSOL in the pre node or the node IP callbacks. But in this case, they will be queued until the first point where the solver is ready to process them. So they will not be processed directly. So that typically happens shortly after the node AP solve callback is fired. Um, there's also one more implication for Moselle users. So when Moselle uses the XPS at MIPSOL function, it typically loads it as a partial, partial solution, calling the solver to delay the processing of it. And um, with this most change now is that we can detect where the solution being passed from Moselle is a partial or a full solution. And for a full solution, we can process it more easily and simply accept or uh, reject it directly. Okay, and there's one more for uh, modification or one more update here. Um, functions that modify constraints um, were never really intended to be called during a solve. Now this will explicitly raise an error if attempted. Um, so this applies to loading a basis, branching directive, delayed rows or model cuts during a solve. So all of these things should only be done before a solve. This will now waste an error. And uh, also XPS load MIPS so can no longer be called during a solve. Uh, that's now explicitly prevented. Will waste an error. You should always use XPS at MIPS all inside callbacks. I just spoken about in length. So Python has seen some significant uh, improvements in usability, particularly with the introduction of linked variables and constraints and special order sets. So these linked objects are now associated directly with specific problems, whereas previously variables were created independently and then added to a problem. So slight change. Um, this change eliminates issue that are related to the lack of a direct link between a variable or constraint and a specific problem. So um, in the past, why we had those, one advantage is you could create them independently and then you could add them to multiple problems. Um, but uh, this could cause issues because there was no direct link between the variables or constraints and the particular problem. So going forward, these so-called unlinked objects are deprecated, you should use the new method on the next slide. I will well, show something like a translation um, of creating linked objects um, and using linked variables or constraints brings a couple of benefits. So you directly modify the underlying problem. Uh, for example, changing the right-hand side of a constraint uh, or the bound on a variable updates the problem directly. And well, most likely all of this seems quite natural anyway to many experienced Python users. So we 
in a sense, just made our API more Pythonic here. Um, and this also improves performance, by the way, when working with larger problems. So the main difference lies here in the creation. So you see that you now can use a single statement to create and add a variable directly to the problem, where previously you would first create it without a problem context inside the express environment, and then only add it later to a problem in the second step. And same for sets of variables. When you want to create them, you create them directly uh, from the problem objects, where in the past you created independent variables. And really the same with special ordered sets. Um, the constraints then will follow the specification of the variables. If it's linked variables, then it's automatically a linked constraint. Um, so the process of building constraints really should not change here. And do not try mixing links and unlinked variables in the same constraint. That will, as you might have expected, raise an error. And what else is there? I have one more. A uh, small note, we now officially support Python 3.12. Okay, performance, highlight of most uh, released presentations here. So um, you see here our typical performance improvements year on year. So one year ago, the uh, current Express release was 9.0. Now it's 9.4. We see some nice improvements all across the board, some small improvements on, uh, on the AP side with barrier carrying forward to concurrent. This mostly comes from the AVX2 um, improvements. Then there's our MIP, MIP benchmarks where we saw a nice 14% improvement overall and uh, more than 20% improvements on hard models that take more than 100 seconds to solve. Uh, really nice uh, improvement. Then there's our set of so-called so -called PDI set, which considers instances that are well hard to impossible to solve the op optimality, where we only look at the speed of convergence of the primal and dual bounds that will not converge to, uh, to zero eventually, but uh, we try to, or we measure how fast uh, they uh, converts towards each other. This is the so-called PDI measure. Uh, and here we use our aforementioned QA emphasis equals one settings for those hard, super hard map problems. And we observed an improvement of 14% in this PDI primary dual integral measure. Um, some really nice improvements on quadratic problems, 70% faster on hard models, 23% overall and tremendous improvements as promised earlier on our still relatively young uh, global solver. So these are the big steps that you take in the beginning over a year. So since our beta release that has to be set in 9.0, uh, we became a factor of 12 faster there. But now towards the end, I would like to announce a few things. So first I would like to point out the Express Best Paper Award. So this is an academic award that honors great scientifically variable publications that use FICO Express. So this can be a paper in one of the very known OR, MS or optimization journals. Also a paper that is published in the thoroughly reviewed conference proceedings can be on solving new types of problems or developing your application specific algorithms that solve some sub problems via Express, or it can be a paper on a new mathematical optimization method based on an Express callback implementation. And as we will see in a moment, all of this uh, has happened and succeeded in this award already. Or, well, yeah, really all imaginary research uh, using Express optimization products played a significant role. So the author of the winning paper will be awarded a price of $1,500. And for the third edition of the award, all papers will qualify that are published within the years 2023 or 2024. So there's more than half a year left to get something published. And then you need to submit your paper by the end of January next year. So it's a great pleasure for me to now for the first time announce publicly the winner of this year's best paper 
Award, uh, Bjorna Ludberget and Giorgio Sato, for their great work on the feasibility jump heuristic that has been published in mathematical um, programming computation. And by the way, was an inspiration also for our uh, developer team who has picked this up in already in the previous release. And the runner up in 2024 goes to a team from Amazon with their great work on scalable timing aware network design where they solve some really big problems with millions of variables and constraints using Express. So congratulations. And yeah, um, if you want to learn more about this award-winning research or about the award winners of last year, I should say, uh, or how to get express licenses, or you really just want to get in touch with us, then please visit our community website. So here you can download a community license, start playing with the software immediately. If you're an academic, you sh um, should consider our academic partnership program, which grants you full licenses for all express servers, given that you work at an academic academic institution or that you want to participate say in an academic uh, award involving express and uh, the community is also the place to go when you want to learn more about express and the uh, technology it implements so you can post the forum you can view some training material you can read uh, the blogs like our blog on the us tech emphasis mode or a blog on the right choice of hardware for optimization servers, or a blog on how to tune the server for your personal problem, or that can be found in our community. So, and this talk was talk number two in a series of release webinars. If you are a Workbench user, I highly recommend tuning in tomorrow for the latest update in Workbench 3.13. Workbench 3 and for all uh, Java and C Sharp aficionados. Uh, the aforementioned webinar on June 4th is definitely of high interest for you. And finally, I would like to announce the CEO at Work Summer School that I am co hosting and that FICO is a main sponsor of. So, this two week summer school is aimed at everyone who is interested in computation optimization and how it's actually used in practice. So, you see the Great list of uh, speakers there um, with great people from different universities and from many, many different companies. The in-person event is unfortunately already completely booked out at this point. We even uh, closed the waiting list uh, at this point. And uh, all the lectures, however, will be streamed online. So um, you can register for free for the online event now and find more information about the content on the CEO at Work homepage, which I hope by now has the uh, also this registration information uh, online. When I looked earlier this morning, this was not yet there. So fresh are the news. Um, and with this, uh, I would like to say thank you. Also in the name of the whole FICO Express Solver, and Moselle developer team, who you see compiled here in this picture from our last week's developer meeting, twice spotting me and Dideka, where we uh, discussed at this developer meetings many ideas for new performance items and for awesome user features, some of which I will certainly be able to tell you about in some future release webinar once they have been brought into existence. I'm looking forward to that and I'm Happy to answer any more questions that might come up for today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Bye-bye.